If you inherited a house located over a water tank full of human-sized water monsters, what would you do? Inheriting a free piece of expensive real estate with spectacular views is like a universal fantasy. You get a nice vacay, some money to pay off debts, and a chance to reconnect with nature. Until you find out about the murders and the monsters sleeping only feet below the foundation of your house, just waiting for the right moment to leave their watery breeding den and hunt you down as prey. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the sewer lizards in the tank. Welcome to the late 70s, the decade brought to you by Disco, the color brown, and a whole lot of quaaludes. Fascism is a thing of the past and the future, and everyone's wrapped in their paisley bell bottoms dancing barefoot to the Bee Gees. Jules and Ben run a pet shop in San Francisco, the sort of place where rats routinely escape their cages, forcing you to lay belly down on the disgusting aisle floor covered in bird droppings, and the axolotls are so stressed they eat each other. They're daughter Reyes just entered that phase where everything turns into a question and she keeps trying to sneak puppies out in her coat. Who hasn't? Not gonna lie, this seems like a pretty sweet setup, aside from those San Francisco rent prices, which leave them constantly strapped and overdrawn at the bank. Things are so tight, Jules went to veterinary school as a side hustle. So glad to see things have changed so much in the last 45 years. After they close down the shop for the day, the diabetes cat walks in. He's in a state lawyer with news about Ben's mom. In addition to being clinically committed multiple times in her life, she also casually forgot to mention she and her husband owned prime real estate on the Oregon coast. That is top shelf insanity. Also, enjoy those back taxes, Ben. You thought you were in dire financial straits before. Oh, wow. It's a palace. All my dreams have come true. Do you think it has power? What, that World War II bunker cosplaying as a location in Alice in Borderland? Their new dream home is suffocated with weeds and caked in lead-based asbestos paint. Relax, it's the 70s. They don't even know that's a thing yet, and no one here is living long enough for it to be a problem. Good thing they planned ahead and brought a gold hearse with them. Turns out, aside from looking like the hovel of a colorblind bog witch, the house is in pretty decent condition. It's even got a sweet deck overlooking the Hobbit's Bay and a spring-fed water tank full of demon I don't know about you, but all I'm seeing here are dollar signs. Time to HGTV the out of this place. but maybe check out the upper floor first before filming your audition for Sewage Wars. Maybe bring a flashlight. Upstairs, they discover the windows have been nailed shut. A little weird, but not that uncommon in seasonal homes or those that need winter windows. It's just too bad they missed the light wildlife damage on the window. I guess we're just lucky whatever clawed at the window didn't know how to break it. Nerds. So you know how important it is to have a cogent, immersive, and most of all, entertaining storyline, right? Guess what? The super popular game called Raid Shadow Legends just released an animated limited series called Call of the Arbiter. The first episode just came out on May 18th and more episodes are coming every Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern until July 20th. You wanted more lore in game? You get it. Download the game and watch Raid Call of the Arbiter for free within Raid Shadow Legends right now. Raid is throwing a big celebration for Call of the Arbiter, and they've added a bunch of awesome features to the game. Dive deep into the stories of the champions featured in the show, like Gallic, Athol, Kale, Elheim, and the fan favorites like Death Knight and Scylla the Drakes. But wait! There's more. They've added 75 new character lore bios, too, to nerd out on. And here's the cherry on top. Through the seven-day loyalty program, you have a chance to get one of the characters from the show as a legendary champion that you can play for free. Everyone has a shot at getting Artak, one of the awesome new characters from the show, for free. All you gotta do is log into Raid for seven days anytime between now and July 24. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, use the link in the description or scan my QR code and you'll score some insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion champion called Knight Errant and other super useful stuff. You don't want to miss out on it, so jump on raid now.
Ben's mother was a huge fan of true crime subscription boxes. The whole place is littered with scraps of eerie newspaper clippings and old journals related to the events that happened in this house right before Ben was born. Is it just me, or has the newspaper clipping thing never made sense? Imagine stopping in the middle of a tragic, scary emergency to delicately cut out newspaper articles to store in a shoebox for future generations to find. You know what? I'm wrong. Those serial killer stories aren't going to scrapbook themselves. And how else am I going to confuse or scare my grandkids long after I'm gone? Apparently, Hobbit's Bay has seen more than its fair share of action. At the turn of the century, an old whaling ship crashed on the beach. There's an insurance claim here for another ship that ran aground in the early 1900s. It says some of the crew went ashore and were never seen again. Yeah, I disappear too. I'm not getting lashed because drunk old pirate Joe ran us aground. Jules and Ben discover that Ben's mom had more secrets than a marine coming back from Bangkok. Half the papers in here are about mysterious deaths of Ben's dad and older sister Rosie. Old police reports say they drowned just off the beach and their bodies were never discovered or recovered. But suspicions fell on Ben's very pregnant mom before the search had even ended. Jules finds his mom's torn up journal going over her last few days in the house. You know it's gonna be a tragic backstory when they go with the underworld gray blue for the flashback. Before his dad disappeared, someone tried to scare the family away from the bay by mailing the ball the Zodiac Killer's first drafts. <laughs> For some reason, receiving some local's printed Twitter feed inspired Daddy Dearest to open up the water tank under the house and vanish into it. Eight days later, their daughter Rosie disappeared too. Apparently, whatever's hunting here doesn't have a taste for pregnant chicks, which means these things don't like two-for-one specials. They truly are monsters. In the night, Rhea wakes up to find something big pressing on the floor beneath her room, leaving indentations on the carpet like a shark's fin. So, there's just, like, no floor under this carpet? Okay. She runs upstairs to wake her parents. The thing outside makes no attempt to be quiet. Clatters and guttural growls drive Jules and Ben downstairs, then outside to look for whatever's making the noises. Uh, you two do realize you're in the Pacific Northwest, right? The land of moose, grizzlies, and sasquatches. All of those things will f*** your f*** up. Whatever's moving around out there sounds huge and hungry. A combination we do not need to be investigating right now. Ben emerges onto the deck through a door that was just left wide open. Just why? If it's not bears, it's rabbits, deer, weasels, chipmunks, squirrels, rats. Enjoy waking up to a bobcat munching on your dog at the dinner table. Jewels follows the sounds of Darth Vader having an asthma attack to the front door and out into the woods. Just remember to throw the that lantern directly at the bear's face, Jules. That should buy you an extra couple seconds to flee. Look, is this weird glottal purring giving me Jurassic Park flashbacks? Yeah, it is. But even porcupines growl. Mountain lions scream like a woman being murdered. <coughs> Don't go outside, just in case it's the latter. But I'm not assuming this is a human hunting cryptid until I see it for myself. We could draw it out of hiding pretty easily anyway. Just take a hot dog or burger, whatever we brought with us, and tie it to a rope or string with belts or silverware in the pinch. Then hang it within sight of the house and wait. When the monster comes a-ringin', we can see what we're actually dealing with. In the morning, Jules is feeling unease about the house. And that's before she finds Ben fiddling with a generator in the shed, despite the shed being filled with volatile ammonium nitrate rich fertilizer. Oh yeah, and there's a weird musty cave under the house masquerading as a water tank. If there are any monsters or psychos, don't let them out, okay? Why not both? Just wait until you find your dad's secret red room, Benny boy. Ben gets the old water pipe to the spring working, offering a little blood sacrifice in the process, before he discovers that the xenomorph from all those old documentaries made it to Earth after all. Not fully formed. Outside, Rhea notices the lid to the tank is off and screams when she hears something writhing and growling in the dark. Call me crazy, but if I found this aborted xenomorph in my water tank, I'd buy stock in Evian. The water's polluted with fish 
we need to assume from here on out that that tank needs to be cleaned by a professional before any of us drinks from it. Underground spring or no, unless you're into that flavor, then by all means. A woman calls out to the family and introduces herself as Miriam, a local real estate agent already fantasizing about how she's going to spend her 5% commission rate. She tells them that she's already located a buyer willing to pay more than these two have ever made in their lives for that land. But because she's clearly a self-sabotager, she also tells them the land's been cursed since as early as the 1700s, when an earthquake ripped through the bay and people started disappearing into holes in the ground. Again, definitely sus, but to be fair, the United States is holier than Swiss cheese. Jordan Peele even made a movie about how many caves there are here. People falling into holes is the price you pay to live with a view like this. Jules is thrilled to sell the place. Ben seems reluctant. Remove the fish monsters lurking in the deep, and I would be too. I'd leave offerings to the old gods for a sweet slice of coastal real estate like this. Carve out a five-acre plot for yourselves and sell the rest, and you'll have the best of both worlds. Miriam tells them to think on the deal, then schleps the mile back up the road to where she parked her car in the middle of the forest. Of course, it gets stuck in the mud immediately, and something races by in the underbrush. <laughs> You gotta admire that no delay stealth, no hesitation at all. This is a predator, pure and simple, at least right now, while dealing with a side character. The thing makes quick work, dragging her away and clawing her to death. Tough way to go. In the middle of the night, Jules hears something downstairs, stalking the perimeter of the house. She edges her way to the kitchen. Oh god, it's Jabba the Hutt. Ben rushes in a second too late to see anything. But the next day, his spring water has turned a lovely shade of black, forcing him to enter the water tank that's now chest deep with fish monster soup. Uh, maybe it's time to call a professional, Ben. Any Roto-Rooter guy will do. He reaches down to unclog the pump and pulls something out, right before he's jump scared by a gutted raccoon carcass. He shows it to Jules and says it must have drowned. But in what world do drowned rats rip their own stomachs open, Ben? He also shows Jules the bundle from the pipe. It contains jewelry from his missing sister, Rosie. Jules tells them they have to call the police to check the tank, and Ben finally agrees to head for town for reinforcements. Along the way, Ben finds Miriam's abandoned car and a blood trail leading off the road, all the way to Miriam's flayed corpse. Guess our predator friend was in the mood for guts, or maybe it left the rest as bait for larger prey. Ben can't keep his own guts down. I hope I don't have to say this, but don't pure at the crime scene. Otherwise, it'll become your crime scene. Ben runs back to the car to radio for help. Hello? Shut the door. You just saw a woman's body disemboweled not 50 feet away from her car with the open door. No, let's just assume the thing that ate her is too full to finish us off too. Back at the house, Jules discovers a trail of wet, squelchy footprints leading to a locked room on the main floor, ignoring the back door, which is standing wide open. Jules finds a set of keys and opens what turns out to be Rosie's old room. It's there she finds the rest of Ben's mom's journal, detailing the night something tried to break into the house. Wind blows the door closed, locking her in. She hears growling and sees a shadow under the door. She bashes out the window and races through the back door, sliding on a puddle before she sprints up to the bedroom. Ben arrives and closes the doors. He goes upstairs and tells Jules he radioed the sheriff, who told him to lock the doors and wait for him to arrive. An excellent idea, if you hadn't let the monster already come into your home and hide away somewhere in here. Jules reveals she found out the truth about what happened to Ben's dad and sister. His mother lied about the drownings. <laughs> Holy sh that is cold-blooded. Running while you can still hear the monsters feasting on your own kid. In her last diary entry, Ben's mom tells whoever finds the journal to run. Or, and stay with me here, maybe you could have sold this place a long time ago so no one you knew ever had a reason or curiosity to come here in the first place. I get trying to protect other people, but hiding this land doesn't erase it from existence. I bet your silence killed a couple dozen granola hikers and 
German tourists in the decades since you left, Mom. Jules and Ben make quick time packing, but Ben hears a noise and assumes it must be the sheriff. How about we wait until we hear a human voice call out to us? Where the hell are you going, Ranger Rick? Did some spore in the forest infect your brain with stupid? You were doing relatively well until now. The sheriff rolls up outside. The road ahead is blocked by a downed tree. Every psycho killer and swamp monster's best friend. He gets back in the car to grab a flashlight and leaves his car door wide open like an invitation. <laughs> Godzilla accepts. This looks like the Demigorgon from Stranger Things, the thing from Dreamcatcher. The sheriff reaches for his revolver, but he isn't quick enough. The monster bites into his arm. He fires wildly and with zero accuracy. Dude doesn't even graze it. The beast tackles him out of the car. Ben hears the attack and comes running, but by the time he arrives... <laughs> This is why we don't run through the woods at night. That place belongs to the night now. Dude doesn't even try to help. Ben zoinks out of there faster than Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. But can't say that I blame him. When he gets back to the house, he double checks the doors, which are still unlocked, and tells Jules the sheriff was killed by some kind of reptile. Jules wants to bail, just dart for the car and go. Not ideal, considering the road is slowly turning into an auto lot for the recently murderized. Also not ideal, because this thing seems to only come out at night, and it is currently pitch black out there in a forest you don't know where your only means of escape is a gold hearse with two-wheel drive. But it's not a bad idea if we prepare properly. Ben wants to lure this thing back into the water tank and then blow it up using the fertilizer in the shed. Bro, that's a lot of deadly steps in a row. First, you gotta get that fertilizer in there. Then, you have to lure the beast, seal it in, and set fire to the large cavity under the house your family's currently using as shelter. That's one way to demolish a house and your family. You don't even know how deep that cave is or whether there's gas pockets just waiting for the right spark to blow up the entire coastline. Even if you manage to arrange all that, all that, if you spend more than four seconds thinking about what you've learned so far, you know you have more than one of those things to kill. You poked and prodded one of its dead, misshapen offspring, remember? Yes, some reptile and amphibious species have been known to undergo parthenogenesis, a form of ace reproduction where the female produces without a male. But it's rare enough that even in these bonker circumstances, I'd still assume there's at least two sewer salamanders, if not more. If they are egg-laying amphibians, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of them. Besides, do they even want into the house in the first place? If they do, they're taking their sweet time about it. They haven't even broken a window yet. It would have been nice to grab the sheriff's gun before you bolted back here, but a windowless barricaded room, kitchen knives, and some torches made from broken chair legs would probably tide us over to the morning, when we could beat a hasty retreat without the Hunger Game mutts on our tail. The other tool here, they never use is their boombox. These creatures are blind and seem to hunt by vibration, both noise and movement. Jules and Ben could create a simple distraction for them by turning the boombox into an AM talk radio station and locking it in a far corner of the house, in a room they partially barricaded, to keep the monster's attention off them while they silently hide in another room, or bolt for the car strapped with torches, knives, and pitchforks for protection, and that handy dandy propane flamethrower Jules MacGyvered out of thin air. Ben runs for the shed and creates a makeshift fertilizer bomb. A monster screeches nearby and he beelines for the water tank. Why are you going down there, Ben? You could not pay me enough. And at this point, I feel like you just like it down there. He finds the sheriff's body before shutting off the water and crawling deeper into the cave. One of the creatures watches from the water nearby. Back in the house, whatever spore infected Ben's brain has clearly gotten to Jules. Something bangs on the locked bedroom door and she just opens it. Dear God, can one person not do the dumb thing just once? I mean, I'm glad the dog's okay. Okay, but come on. In the cave, Ben lights the shortest fuse I've ever seen on his bomb and narrowly crawls back to the main tank before it explodes. It's pitiful, which is lucky for him and the head lizard already in the tank with him. <laughs> 
He tries to fight it off with his flashlight, but at the ladder, it pulls him under again and tears into his stomach. I mean, I know you're not dead yet, Ben, but the bacteria in Komodo dragon bites kills people all the time. So, enjoy your painful primordial infection death. Up in the bedroom, the monsters suddenly attack. Jules tries to barricade the door, but it's too little too late. One monster sends the bookshelf down on top of her, while another finally breaks the window and steals Rhea. Ben's too wounded to stop it from dragging her into the tank. Jules tosses what she can at the monster that's looking more and more like a seal crossed with a graboid, until the lantern finally scares it away. Downstairs, she pulls Ben to safety and Hail Mary's a plan to save Rhea. You can't kill us, then. I don't need to. I just need to keep it away from me long enough. If it's an amphibian, it breaks through its skin. This will burn it like acid. Great. So how about we hard poison the water in the tank before we go down there, eh? We need substances that are toxic to amphibians, like household laundry detergents, weed and pest killers, and fertilizer. Some pesticides can kill frogs within an hour of spraying. Look, I don't want to cause an ecological disaster here. <clears throat> but I also don't want to crawl into a pool full of vicious mutant salamanders where they have the upper hand. And they definitely do. Jules enters the water tank and quickly quickly becomes cornered by two of them. She pours chemicals into a laughably small circle around her and holds a pitchfork like a weapon. But it's barely seconds before one of them slips towards her, unseen in the water, and drags her underneath. She gets up once more before it yanks her down and bites into her neck. She's lost her pitchfork. With nothing else, she stabs it with a shattered end of her torch, then dives for her pitchfork while the second beast attacks, ragdolling her in its mouth like a leopard seal with a penguin. <laughs> Awesome. Two down, hundreds to go. And now you don't have a torch either. By light or light, Jewel crawls deeper into the cave, listening as monsters call to each other in the darkness. She finds Rhea sitting by the literal kiddie pool and tells her to go right before the second wave shows up. <laughs> Don't mind us, we know you're there. We're just gonna wait to chase you. Jules pulls her secret weapon out, a handheld propane tank. She loosens the top and uses it as a flamethrower to keep the closest monsters at bay, but it doesn't last long. She and Rhea escape from the water tank and she heaves the lid closed. They hoof it to the car where Jules pockets the sheriff's pistol and discovers the keys are missing. So she goes back for Ben, leaving Rhea to deal with the whole mutant family. Why are all the windows on every car in this movie open? A monster crawls through the car after Rhea, forcing her out. When Jules gets Ben and Rhea back in the car, the monster leers through the open back hatch window and Jules blasts its head off. <laughs> This has been an emotional anti-reptile ad for us all. But if you're ever chased out of your home by the local predator species, just cry on the way to the hospital. You know, cause your husband's still bleeding out like Mr. Orange in the back seat. These bitey boys were pretty hardcore, all things considered. And plot armor saved this family more times than Brad Pitt in World War Z. But the sewer salamanders only seem to attack the house after Ben's fertilizer bomb goes off in the caves. It's possible that if they had remained inside and kept their doors shut for once, they could have made it through the night and escaped during the day. Or they could have tried luring the monsters away with sound or meat to beat a hasty retreat to their car. Whether they survive or not comes down to how arbitrary the monsters are about attacking. But all things considered, not going into the water tank with a half-baked pipe bomb was definitely the smarter move. They would have likely survived the night without needly bites all over their bodies. For those reasons, I think the tank was beaten. And remember, just hire a professional. <laughs>